Hey, how's it going guys? In today's video, I'm going to be taking you through a game where I got 94% accuracy and 2800 performance rating in just an online three minute game, which I feel like it's pretty good. And admittedly, there's not going to be fireworks as such. It's kind of a slow maneuvering game because my opponent plays a Catalan. But I think a lot of it could be really instructive. Um, to learn you know a bit more about positional concepts like actually thinking like strategically rather than tactically so like over a longer time period rather than like one or two move combos because chess isn't always like you know insane wild games the majority of the time at least as you improve at the game your opponents make less mistakes and you've got a work on smaller advantages and kind of create stuff out of very little. So that's what I'm going to show you today. So we have d4 and typically I have played the King's Indian, you know, the, the, the typical King's Indian setup. But I really haven't been having much luck in it. So I've started playing um, this kind of system where I have d5, knight f6, I go for a Fianchetto with my light squared bishop because the whole point is to put pressure on e4 and attempt to trade the dark squared bishop off for the knight when it moves to either of those squares like a Nimzo Indian but not necessarily purely a Nimzo Indian so we have g3 e6 bishop g2 b6 castle bishop b7 like I said my opponent's playing a Catalan and I'm playing this Fianchetto variation to try and control e4. We have knight bd2, knight bd7, c4, and now bishop b4. Now, the reason I don't play bishop b4 here is because my opponent can play c3 and stop me from taking. But here, c4 is already played, so I can play bishop b4. And the knight doesn't really have anywhere good to move. You know, he can go back to b1 if it wants, but I'm happy to see that. And if he goes to b3 to avoid being taken, then c4 hangs. So my opponent can't really stop me from trading my bishop for the knight. So pragmatically, he goes b3, saying, okay, if you're going to take my knight, which I do, then I'm going to defend the pawn with my b-pawn. And here, the computer wants me to take. I go knight e4, because again, I want to fulfill my plan of, of ideally playing f5, knight f6, castle, in like a sort of Dutch Pillsbury knight style, where I'm solely focusing on the light squares. But my opponent doesn't let me do this. He plays bishop b4, which stops me castling, and this basically forces me to play c5, where after takes takes, I cut off the diagonal. And I can, now, I can now castle. My pawns look a little bit fragile, especially after takes takes. This is often called a hanging pawn structure, where it's just two pawns, especially when the files are open against them and they're advancing the position and they can't defend each other at the same time. Like if I advance this pawn, then this pawn could be weak. If I advance this pawn, then this pawn could be weak because obviously pawns don't defend backwards, right? So we have rook c1, but in, in, in this position, the pawns are actually quite strong because this pawn's defended well, and this pawn's defended well, and my opponent's pieces can't really exploit them very well. I mean, he plays logically, right? Putting pressure on the pawns of his pieces, but he's gonna have to prove that it works. And I go queen a5 and go, look, bro, Look, you've got to move this bishop, and I'm winning your pawn. And I know that this isn't going to give me a winning advantage. It's technically a poisoned pawn. Now, rook a1 can't be played straight away because the bishop's hanging. So, queen c2 is played, defending the bishop, and now threatening rook to a1. Here... I need to retreat my queen because it's going to get trapped otherwise. And I've really got two squares to go to, right? Now, 
A6 is apparently the best. But and I, and I think it's because it can access the art uh, like my third rank and it can go wherever it needs to be. Maybe E6 is the right square for it. But I go to A5 because my logic is that my knight and my queen combine quite well on these squares. And maybe I want to go to B4 to put pressure on the pawn. I'm also defending C5 on A5. Whereas if I go to A6, I'm not helping in the defense of my central pawns. Which it's apparently a small inaccuracy. We have rook fd1, again, just piling up the pressure on my pawns. But on the bright side, the bishop's no longer on a3, attacking c5. Rook fd8, I thought this made a lot of sense, because, I mean, I'm getting ready to defend the pawn. I can maybe move my knight to f6 to support this knight, uh, which defends c5, if you get what I mean, um, and open up my rook. Apparently that's bad. Apparently I need to go to the E file, which I considered, but I thought surely my rooks belong on D8 and C8, just to mirror his essentially. And the reason this is bad is because of knight to H4 apparently, which I mean, what? What? Really? It's just odd. It's just really odd. <clears throat> And if I play a move like rook a c8, then I'm losing. I don't know. I don't know. I guess g7 is just too weak. It's strange. It, it's kind of hard to understand. But I guess I can't go here because my king's getting forced out. And I can't actually defend this pawn, which is interesting. But anyway, my opponent doesn't find knight h4. And we don't go into this variation. He plays knight e5. The same intention of opening up his bishop. But here I get to trade. And I was happy about trading this knight because it opens my rook up now. And bear in mind, I am black. My opponent's fairly high rated. If he wants to go for this exchange and get an opposite coloured bishop endgame, I'm going to be up a pawn, because remember I won a pawn on a2. It's probably a draw, but if the queens stay on the board, there's going to be attacking chances, because typically opposite coloured bishops favour the attacking side, because let's imagine these pieces come off the board, and I therefore have a light coloured bishop against a dark squared bishop my opponent's dark squ sorry light squares are going to be very exploitable because this bishop can't help defend them especially because these pawns are all on dark squares if they were all on light squares it'd be a bit of a different story like imagine he had a setup with like e4 f3 pawn on g2 that's harder to exploit because my bishop's going to be blunted but here his light squares around his king are quite weak right so I don't really mind if he wants to go for this exchange, even though it could lead to a draw in the end game. I'm going to take the chance, especially because his bishops are so strong here, right? So I continue with the plan. I go f6 here, which ju ju just to kick the bishop out. And my logic is that, again, if these get exchanged, this bishop's going to be blunted by my f6 pawn. And it doesn't matter that I'm weakening the light squares because I'm expecting him to exchange the light squared bishop at some point for my knight. And I've got a light squared bishop to defend those light squares if need be. So we have e3, which I didn't really understand, uh, to be honest. I thought maybe it was just taking the pawn off a light square so it wouldn't be vulnerable. But it just further weakens the light squares around the king. Um, it's not losing or anything. The position's completely equal. But it's just a small positional weakness. So I play queen b6. And I just want to get off the a file. Because rook a1 can come with tempo. a7 can be weak. I'm also keeping an eye on b3 now. So the queen can't just move to e2 or something. 
because I can probably take apparently what oh wow okay well that's insane but you get my point it just puts pressure on the b3 pawn so he takes which i expected and goes queen c4 check and plays bishop a3 and goes i'm gonna win your pawn and i go go ahead mate go ahead we have takes takes and queen takes because if bishop takes i actually I think I was just going to take here. And we we're just going to get drawn endgame, essentially. Because my opponent's up a pawn, but it's opposite colored bishops. So there's no real way my opponent can win this. I'm just going to put my, my pawns on light squares. But it makes it just a bit difficult for my opponent. And he plays queen takes, expecting something like this. But I didn't want to do this because I thought that a f a7 just falls. And although in the previous position, here I was like, this is a this is an easy draw. This is a bit different because the rooks are still on the board, so there could be some potential problems. Like my opponent could actually get the pawn going because his rook can help with the with defense of light squares to force the pawn through. So I didn't want to do this. I instead took on b3 because his queen is no longer defending it, which was the whole point of putting my queen on b6. And it looks a little scary, because my king might be vulnerable to back rank things, but there's nothing concrete. And my opponent plays queen e7, trying to exploit the fact that my rook is undefended and the back rank is weak. But I have mate in four, with two different two different ways. I'm sure you can spot it. And I could have played rook here. I didn't. Why didn't I do that? I didn't think this worked. It did work, but I didn't think it did. Why did I think that? I think I just missed that I could play bishop f1 here. Which is what happens if I play queen d1, which is what I played. I don't I don't know why I didn't do that. I think I just didn't move the rook because I was worried about the back rank being open if one of my moves didn't come with check. But I have a minute 30. There's no reason for me to be missing that. I spent 20 seconds. I play queen d1. Takes takes. King g2. Bishop f1. King g1 and bishop h3. And it's mate because the light squares were just way too weak. Like especially with this pawn controlling f3, the king has no way out. And queen e7 is just a huge, huge blunder. A huge blunder. Um, but it's interesting, because I did check this, and the position <clears throat> is, although, although it says point 0.2, there are only three moves in the position. <laughs> and those moves are h3, h4, and g4 creating dark squares for the king to run to. So like if g4 is played, for example, this no longer works because king g2, bishop f1, king g3, and the king escapes. And if h3, it's the same story. The rooks get exchanged and the king escapes to h2 and makes use of the light squares. And this is just a, a, a dead draw. Especially with the opposite colored bishops. I probably have to just go queen d8 to stop back rank mate. <clears throat> Play something like this. And just create a blockade on the light square. Well, it actually doesn't matter. Because it's just 4v4, opposite colored bishops. The queens aren't going to do anything. Realistically. Maybe I've got chances because his light squares are so weak. But it's, it's just a draw. Queen e7 though just abandons the back rank and it's mate. Which I just thought was really instructive because this whole game, there, there was nothing wild. There was nothing to really exploit in the position apart from the final move. Um, being queen e7 just blundering mate in 4. But there, there was nothing concrete to 
exploit from my opponent. It's just positional play, control of e4, getting this hanging pawn structure and having to defend it for my life, essentially, because if one of them falls, it's game over. I win a2, but it's it's not over at all. Um, we get this position where my pawns are very well defended, but we have the exchange of bishop for knight to weaken c5, which is one of the problems of the hanging pawn structure, because if one of them has to move to take in some way, then they're going to become split. And, you know, just, just, just carrying on, trying to play the best moves, even though it looks very drawerish, because your opponent can always blunder, right? E e even at this level, your opponent makes stupid blunders, so y you might as well keep fighting, you know? You might as well. So, if you stayed until the end, I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.